Home, or do you want me to do that, guys? Uh, I think uh, you might have setting. Uh, you might be able to hit the uh, red dots everyone that comes into the room. Uh, to do it manually, I guess. But at least for everyone coming in, I think that setting has to be on there. Otherwise, they'll come in on the red dotted. Okay, I think I just did that. Do you have? Oh yeah, I think I just did that to clip because poor Janice sixty four just got automatically red dotted when she came in the room. So that's already set. Uh, Matt, do you want to red dot the rest of the room, or do you want me to do that, or you want to do that? I can work from the bottom all the way up. You want to go from the top down? Sounds like a plan. You work from the bottom up. I work from the top down. You guys want to try try typing something in the room to make sure the red dot text works? All you guys who are red dotted, try typing something in the room. All right, I guess that's working pretty good. I could type something in the room, so there you go. Good. Okay, great. By the way, just so you know, Calvinists have my permission to type to, uh, to record the debate and to play it play it wherever they want. Uh, within a week or so, uh, Jade Mine is going to have my debate out uh, my debate tonight uh, uh, placed on my website. Uh, this is where you'll be able to find it, uh, kingmessiahproject.com, if you guys want to save it or not, it's up to you. Okay, I'm ready to start whenever Matt, uh, Matt Yester and Crossbox are ready to begin. You guys PM each other, let me know when you're ready, and I'll be ready to go, too. Go ahead, Cross. I'll start the timer as soon as you start speaking. All right. Well, many of you may be expecting a debate on unconditional election and predestination tonight. And while these things are certainly related and might be touched on, uh, the main point of our debate is to settle whether or not Romans 9 is speaking about individuals or about nations. Uh, my position is obviously, as the Calvinist, uh, my main point is that Romans 9 is speaking of the election or choice of specific individuals. And my secondary point, which is directly related, will be that Romans 9 is also talking about the salvation of those individuals basically election of individuals unto salvation. And we get started with verse 3 where Paul has something uh, very big on his heart here. He says, I wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. And we know right away that Paul is speaking of salvation here because he says he, w he wishes that he could be cut off from Christ for their sake. And as we know, the great majority of the Jewish people uh, had been and were rejecting the Messiah, resulting in their own eternal destruction and damnation. And the fact that Paul has such anguish in his heart uh, proves that he has their salvation in mind. He sa goes on to say that they are Israelites and to them belong adoption, glory, covenants, the law, worship, and promises. All these blessings have been given to Israel and it would seem as if these, all of these things would guarantee their salvation. I mean, after all, God promises in Jeremiah 31 to give them a new heart, to put his spirit within them, and to forgive their sins. Um, so why are so many Israelites not believing? This is the problem raised by Paul. Why are so many Israelites being lost and, and dying in their sins? Has the word of God failed? Have the promises of God failed? Um, and in these first few verses, Paul has presented this so-called problem, and he will not only give a direct answer to the problem in the next few verses, but he's going to also spend the rest of the chapter explaining this very answer. And what is this answer? Pay close attention. The most important verse tonight. Verse 6. But it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. I would suggest to the room that the only way to understand this verse is of individuals. Notice it says, who are descended from Israel? Who descends from Israel? Do nations descend from Israel? No, people descend from Israel, individuals. And Paul's point and his problem is that not every physical individual descended um, from Israel belongs to the true Israel, the spiritual Israel. And Paul is making a distinction between a true Jew and a simple Jew according to the flesh. He did this earlier in, in Romans 2. No one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision uh, of physical, but Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart and of the spirit. So there's a difference between the physical Israel and the true spiritual Israel. 
um, he doubles down on this by saying also not and not all our children of Abraham simply because there is offspring but through Isaac your offspring shall be named he explains this this means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God but the children of promise are uh, counted as offspring certainly salvation is in mind here that phrase children of God used by Paul through all his writings always referring to saved individuals that's what it means to be a child of God and so what do we have so far we have Paul giving us a supposed problem why is not all Israel saved given the fact that they have all these promises and blessings has the word of God failed the answer obviously is no he says so in verse 6 the promises were never for every individual Israelite to begin with um, so Paul's going to spend the rest of this chapter from this point forward explaining his answer by giving examples. In verse 9, this word for is very important. Many people want to suggest that Paul departs at this point to give us some sort of meaningless history lesson. Paul's not giving us a history lesson, folks. He is further explaining what he just said. For this is the promise. About this time next year, we'll turn Sarah will have a son. Um, here's our first example that not every fleshly descendant um, within Israel is of the promise or of the true Israel. Uh, uh, two sons from the same father, one is Isaac, one is Ishmael. Abraham wanted Ishmael to receive those blessings of inheritance, but God chose Isaac. Isaac was the child of promise. And here in the very first generation, we have Paul's argument um, already demonstrated clearly that not all who are children of the flesh are the children of God or the children of promise. Verses 10 through 13, and not only this, meaning in addition, he gives another example. Rebecca also, she had twins. Before the twins were born, they had done nothing good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger as it is written, Jacob I loved, Esau I hated. Here we have the second generation and the same thing applies in the second generation. Just as being a physical descendant of Abraham doesn't mean you're a child of promise, neither does being a physical offspring of Isaac automatically make you a child of promise. It's God's choice which determines these things. And notice that Paul is naming these individuals by name, Isaac, Jacob, and Esau. I submit that the only way that these verses have anything to do with Paul's initial argument that I went over in, in verses 1 through 5 is if they are being used to demonstrate God's choice of individuals. If they're simply about nations, um, rather than answering the problem, all he's doing is, uh, if these are about nations, he's just simply restating the very facts that led to this problem in the first place, that not all Israel is saved. Right? So it's only in engaging in a discussion of individuals where Paul, where Paul explains the answer of ver in ver given in verse 6. And I'll post it again. Not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. So I want you all to keep this specific verse in mind when you listen to Lou's opening statement and ask yourself, does Lou's explanation of these verses and these examples given, do they answer this question? Do they explain the answer in verse 6? Or do they leave the problem unanswered? Now I'm running very short on time already. Um, there's a lot to get in, so I'm going to pick up the pace at this point. Since we're not debating in a conditional election, specifically tonight, I'm going to pass over the next few verses which speak directly to that. In summary, they teach that God will have mercy on whomever he chooses, and the choice of God on whom he will have mercy does not depend on human will or exertion, but solely on God's own purposes. We reach verse 19. You will say to me, then, why does he still find fault? For who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Well, what does molded say to its molder? Why have you made me like this? Notice the old man here is singular, making it clear that an individual person is the one who is speaking, speaking and asking, why have you made me like this? It's an individual. We know then that the next verse verses which speak about the clay being molded or made into a vessel, that we are talking about individual human beings, and we go on. Has the potter no right over the clay to make from the same lump one vessel for honorable, another for dishonor? What if God, desiring to show his wrath, has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction, in order to make known the riches of his glory on vessels of mercy which he prepared beforehand for glory? Here, once again, is God's sovereign white right to do what he will with his creation, being laid forth. And we have vessels of destruction being contrasted with vessels of mercy. Are these vessels being spoken of here merely nations? The next verse makes it clear. Vessels of uh, mercy prepared before him for glory, even us, whom he has called, not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. We Christians are the vessels of mercy, whom God has chosen and called. And we have been prepared beforehand for glory. That word glory there. Is there any mistaking that Paul is talking about salvation in these verses? I think not. Vessels of mercy prepared for glory, even us, whom he has called, not from among the Jews only. Notice, it's from among the Jews and from among the Gentiles. And this refutes the idea that God has chosen and calls all Jews 
and Gentiles. God has chosen specific individuals from among the Jews and Gentiles. And this is made abundantly clear all the way through Romans 9. And let me break here shortly to say that uh, something about these Old Testament passages which are being referenced by Paul. I am in no way saying that those texts don't mean what they mean in their original context. I have no issue with those verses in their context. What I'm pointing out here is that it is wrong to go back to the Old Testament, take that context, and force it back into the context of Romans 9, because you destroy the flow of Paul's argument in the process. What Paul is doing is citing references from the Old Testament which demonstrate the very principle which Paul is explaining here in Romans 9, and that principle is God's sovereign right to choose. It's almost like when Jesus takes the Old Testament commandment, thou shalt not murder. Jesus takes it to a new level of revelation and meaning by saying, if you hate someone, you've committed murder in your heart. And so now we can look back and understand the fuller meaning of that commandment, which has been there all along. Jesus isn't changing what it means to murder. He's giving a fuller revelation of its very meaning and principle. And the same thing goes for Paul with, with election in Romans 9. Paul is not changing the fact that God elected nations. What he's doing is demonstrating a fuller understanding of that God's choice extends to individuals as well. And now, just as we look back on thou shalt not murder, and more fully understand it. We can look back to those Old Testament passages and more fully understand how God was at work in his electing of individuals. Do not be mistaken. Even within those very Old Testament passages, although national election is so clear, we can also see God at work on the individual level, having chosen Isaac over Ishmael and Jacob over Esau. In fact, it's only in recognizing that those passages teach, teaches individual election as well that answer the very problem why not all physical Israel is saved. You have to remember that. I believe it is clear that if we start at the beginning of Romans 9 and go to the end, if we recognize the problem that is being raised, which is not all Israel is saved, and the answer to the problem that not all physical Israel was promised to be saved anyways, and we understand the examples given to explain those answers, it can clearly be seen that Paul is teaching that God elects individuals unto salvation. It is the only understanding that gives any answer to Paul's problem raised in verse, verses 1 through 5. Why is not every individual Israelite saved? Because God never has not chosen every single individual to be saved to begin with. Rather, he has chosen specific individuals out of Israel. God's work has not failed. And I will post verse 24 just to remind us. Even us whom he has called from the Jews, not from the Jews only, but from the Gentiles, meaning out of. Thank you. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Cross Box. Uh, well, first of all, Calvinists, as you know, use Romans 9 as their proof of God's predestining some for salvation, and they use three illustrations given by Paul to prove their point. First, God loving Jacob and hating Esau. That's in Romans 9, 13. The second one is the hardening of Pharaoh's heart in Romans 9, 17 through 18. And the third is clay in the hands of God, who is the potter, Romans 9, 21. Now, when put in biblical and historical context, however, there's nothing in Romans 9 for those in the Calvinist or Reformed theology camps to justify their doctrine of predestination. This is pretty much due to the fact that their arguments that they make do not harmonize with the rest of the Bible. In fact, they contradict the rest of the Bible. Now, both R.C. Sproul and Norman Geisler write, Regarding unclear passages, one should always use clear passages of Scripture to interpret the unclear ones. Now I, along with many other apologists, tend to take this one step further. Rather than taking one verse, one passage, or one chapter from the Bible and basing doctrine on just that, one should consider the entirety of the Bible to explain the hard-to-understand verses, passages, and chapters. Throughout this, this, this debate, I intend to show that Reformed apologists tend to do just that. They use the more vague texts, take them conveniently out of context, and attempt to justify their tulip. Now, if Romans chapter 9 does not support the Reformed doctrine of predestination, what does it do? What does it teach? Actually, it supports four basic principles that are repeated throughout Scripture. First, God's initial choice of Israel in accomplishing His purpose. Second, though God has placed Israel aside for the moment, he's not finished with them. Third, it defines the true Israel of God as the, as the descendants of Jacob who believe in the prophets and therefore embrace Jesus as their Messiah. After all, Romans 9, 6 states, they are not all Israel that are of Israel. And fourth, 
Judgment on the nations that ignore God's mercy, his covenant relationship with his people. Esau, along with Pharaoh, are the examples that we are to, to learn by given in this chapter. Now, let's begin with Romans 9.1. Paul writes, I say, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continual uh, sorrow in my heart. For I, I could not wish that myself were I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. Clearly he's speaking about Israel. What does he say about Israel? Who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. Okay? Now is Paul saying here that God has forgotten Israel? Not in the Bible he doesn't. Uh, it says in verse 5, Whose are the fathers, and of whom as concerning the flesh Christ came, who is overall God blessed forever. Let's go and show that Paul is not teaching that God has forsaken Israel. Romans 11, 1 and 2. I say then, had God cast away his people? God forbid. For I am also an Israelite, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God had not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Okay, so what's Paul's theme throughout Romans? God has not cast away his people. Now, what does it say in Romans 9, 6? They are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Is Paul redefining who Israel is? No, he's not. Because when you go back to John chapter 3, verse 5, you'll find that Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus, an Israelite, a Pharisee. And he says this, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born of the water, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So Jesus is saying, hey, just because you're an Israelite doesn't mean you have an automatic entrance into the kingdom of God. You need to be an Israelite who believes in him. That's the second requirement, being born of the water. Being a physical descendant of Jacob doesn't, isn't the only thing that cuts it. You have to believe it, be a physical descendant of Jacob who believes in Christ. They are not all Israel that are of Israel. Paul is saying here that, hey, just because you're an Israelite doesn't mean that you're of the Israel of God. You need to be an Israelite that believes in Christ. Okay, verse 7. Neither because they are of the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. What, what, God, what Paul is doing here is he's showing that He's showing God's selection of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in Romans, uh, in Romans chapter 9, verses 7 through 12. Okay, let's skip to verse 13. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Now this is one of the most abused verses that Calvinists use to show that, hey, God hated Esau. God had every right to hate Esau. But let's take a look at this verse, and let's take a look at this verse carefully. Let's go to other verses and see, did God really hate Esau? Well, let's go to Luke chapter 14, verse 26, where the same exact Greek word is used. This is what Jesus said. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Let me ask you a question. Is Jesus saying that you can't be his disciple unless you hate his mother and father, unless you hate your mother and father? Of course he's not. He's saying that you need to love him more than you love your own mother and father and children. You can't be his disciple unless you love your mother, father and children less than you love him. He's not saying that one of the requirements to be his disciple is if you hate your mother, father, and children. So the, and the same Greek word is used in Luke 14, 26, as is used in Romans chapter 9, verse 13. Did God love Jacob and hate Esau the way we understand the word hate? No. He loved Jacob, but he loved Esau less. He loved Esau less than he loved Jacob. The same exact Greek word is used in Luke 14, 26, as in, Rome, as in Romans 9, 13. Let's continue. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with, unrighteousness with God? God forbid. 
God can do what he wants. God's sovereign. He chose Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The second requirement for their salvation, just because they're an Israelite, they need to be a believer in Christ. They need to be born of the water and of the Spirit. Verse 15. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. God is showing his sovereignty. He could do what he wants. If any nation, if any people want to complain about the fact that he chose Israel, that's their problem. God is basically showing his sovereignty. I want to move on to Romans 9:16. So then it is he that willeth nor of him that runneth, but of God that shows mercy. Verse 17, For the scripture says unto Pharaoh, Even for the same purpose I have raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. God, ro God, uh, rose, uh, God uh, rose Pharaoh up for the purpose because he knew that even though Pharaoh would not let the people go, God raised him up for this very purpose, to show the world as an example, that if you come against his people, he will punish them just like he punished Egypt. He rose Pharaoh up for that very purpose. Therefore, have the mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will, he hardeneth. Yet God did harden Pharaoh's heart. But Pharaoh's heart was hardened already. And even though God hardened Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh refused to let the people go. Exodus 7:14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refused to let the people go. He refused to let the people go. Even after God hardened Pharaoh's heart, God pleased with Pharaoh. Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, How long will thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let my people go. I want to go over the potter and the clay. Who's the potter and the clay in Romans 9.21? God is the potter. Israel is the clay. Not the Gentiles. Israel is the clay. How do we know? We go to Lamentations 4.2. Is what it says. The precious sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold. How are they esteemed as earthen pitchers? The work of the hands of the potter. Jeremiah 18, verse 6. The same writer. Jeremiah 18, verse 6 says this. O house of Israel, cannot I do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hands, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. Is Israel as the clay? Yes, Israel is the clay. Let's move on to Romans 9.21. Romans 9.21. One lump, one lump of clay. Keep that in mind. Romans 9.21. Had not the potter power over the clay of the same lump, to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. The same lump, the one vessel unto honor are the Israelites who believe in Christ. The vessels unto dishonor are the Israelites who choose to reject Christ. One lump. My time is up. Crossbox, you're up. of nations because it's obviously Lou's main argument tonight and it's what I'm arguing against, okay? The objection uh, that you heard um, is, is that the names mentioned in Romans 9, Jacob, Esau, Isaac, Moses, and Pharaoh, are to be understood uh, as, as the nations they represented, uh, as Lou says, mainly Israel, rather than the individual persons themselves. Now, it's true that, that these individuals, Jacob, Esau, and Isaac, for example, um, represented nations in the Old Testament. However, Clearly, it is Paul's intention to focus on them as individuals for the sake of his argument in Romans 9, um, uh, which I pointed out in my opening statement. After all, God uh, has to choose an individual person to be a father of a nation anyways, doesn't he? He has to choose an individual to, to do that. And not only does God choose the individual to be the father, but he also has to, he's also chosen individuals who descend from those fathers. It's obvious, as my opening statement points out, that not every descendant is chosen. Um, as Paul clearly demonstrated in Romans 9 um, with, the, with the first two examples. Um, uh, um, let's see here. Now, what I'm often accused of, of saying when I, when I talk on Romans 9 is that it would mean that Paul is somehow taking these Old Testament uh, passages out of context, and this is absolutely false. Paul is using the principle taught in these Old Testament verses that it is God's free sovereign right to choose and he is using that overall principle to explain the answer to the problem that he raised in verses 1 through 5 and this brings me to an important point um, we're supposed to interpret the Old Testament in light of the New Testament not the other way around 
This is the historic Protestant uh, position regarding biblical interpretation. Um, doing what Lou has done and going back to the Old Testament, deriving the Old Testament context, and then plugging and forcing that back into Romans 9 makes an absolute mess out of the direct context of, context of Romans 9 itself. In fact, it completely ignores the direct context of Romans 9. It doesn't allow Paul to speak for himself, and it doesn't allow Paul, who's the inspired writer of Scripture, to argue his points. Instead of allowing Paul to tell us what Paul is arguing, as you saw, Lou is jumping off elsewhere, and Lou himself tries to tell Paul what Paul is arguing. And in essence, he's placing rules and regulations on the way Paul is allowed to use the Old Testament. This is a horrible way to exegete Scripture. Lou presents Romans 9 as, as if it's some sort of code that can only be cracked if we go back to find out what the original context of the Old Testament verses was. Paul was aware of the Old, con Old Testament. Excuse me, Old Testament context. Paul was aware of that. The people who Paul was writing to were also well aware of those Old Testament contexts. And once again, Paul is, is not simply giving them a history lesson, nor is he simply reminding them of things that they already know. It's not a reminder. Paul is using the principles that they're familiar with from those passages and bringing them to a new level of understanding, as I said in my opening statement. He's showing that God's sovereign right to truth does not stop at the national level, but it extends to the individual as well. And take this for example. I mean, look, Abraham is referenced as, as the father of many nations in Genesis. Yet does that mean every time we read the name Abraham in the New Testament, we think of all the nations he represented rather than the individual Abraham himself? Of course not. We allow the immediate context to determine what Abraham means when it's used. And the same goes for the names used in, in Romans 9. This is a made-up rule by Lou that says, well, since Jacob and Esau represented uh, nations and Jacob it represented Israel, wherever we find their names in the New Testament, or maybe just in Romans 9, we plug in those nations rather than understand it to be speaking of the actual individuals themselves. I'm sorry, but it does not follow. We allow the context where the names are cited to determine whether individuals or nations are being referenced. And Romans 9 is clearly individuals, as I demonstrated in my opening statement. As you heard, Lou has a hermeneutic that says, Scripture interprets Scripture, verse interprets verse. We must take the whole Bible. And I fully agree with that hermeneutic. But where Lou goes wrong is that Lou assumes that the entire Bible has the exact same context. And so when you combine that false assumption with the idea that Scripture interprets Scripture, you come up with this ability to make Scripture say whatever you want. And you can make the Bible say whatever you want if you ignore context. You don't read your emails that way, you don't read your newspaper that way, you don't talk that way, and you surely don't read your Bible that way, or you shouldn't, anyways. Um, it's true, the Bible has one ultimate author, who is God, but that does not mean that the Bible has one context. God used different men in different times, in different places, to, to write scripture, right? And immediate context is what is most important. And it's my opinion that only one of us tonight has remained grounded in the immediate context of Romans 9. In fact, let's actually look at some of the scriptures in Romans 9 to demonstrate this. Romans 9, she, verse 12, she was told the older, older will serve the younger. Paul cites this. If you notice, this is a citation of Genesis 25, 23. And look, he only quotes, Paul only quotes the last half of the verse. Look, two nations are in a room, two peoples. If Paul missed a perfect opportunity to make loud and clear that he was referencing nations in Romans 9, but he only quotes the last part of the verse. Why does he do this? Was he taking the verse out of context? Of course not. This isn't Paul taking the verse out of context. Paul is being selective in the principle um, he wants to highlight from these verses, which is God's sovereign right to choose, and he's taking that principle to explain his argument in Romans 9, which is of individuals. And individuals, once again, is the only interpretation that has anything to, whatsoever to do with Paul's argument at the beginning of Romans 9. I have no issue with the original context of the Old Testament passage, and neither does Paul. We're not debating those uh, texts tonight. I'm not trying to say they don't say what they're saying in their original, original context. My point is to focus on how Paul himself uses those texts. Allow Paul to speak for himself. Paul is an aspi aspired writer. Surely he has that freedom. We're not debating where the Old Testament verses uh, Paul quotes from talking about nations or individuals. Our debate tonight is, is Romans 9 talking about uh, nations or individuals? Um, that's what we're debating tonight. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Coach Boss. First of all, this new level of understanding that you're claiming that Paul is making is certainly not the reformed view of predestination. Okay? Now, let's go back to Romans 9, 13. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Is that quoted in the, new th in, in the, in the book of Genesis? No, it's not. That's a quote from Malachi chapter 1, speaking about nations. Edom is a nation. Malachi 1, 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, saith the Lord, 
Yet you say, wherein how thou loved us? Speaking of a group, a group. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, referring to the book of Genesis, saith the Lord, yet I love Jacob. And I hated Esau, and laid his mountains waste, and his heritage waste, for the dragons of the wilderness. Wherefore, whereas Edom saith, Edom is the nation of Edom, descendants of Esau, we are impoverished but we will return and build the desolate places. Okay? So clearly, it's a quote from Malachi chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, referring to the nation of Edom and the nation of Israel. Genesis 25, 23. Paul's not changing the meaning of Genesis 25, 23. Two nations are in thy womb. Paul needs to quote the whole verse. Does he need to quote the whole chapter? Two nations, Israel and Edom. Okay? Is, uh, Esau and Jacob, they're all nations. Edom, Israel, Jacob, they're, they're all nations, okay? Two nations are in thy womb. Now, let's go on to, uh, let me go on ahead. Now, let's go talk about the clay. The clay. Lamentations chapter 4, verse 2. What's the clay here? What does the Old Testament teach us that the clay is? The precious sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold, how are they esteemed as earthen pitchers? The work of the hands of the potter. Who's the clay? Jeremiah chapter 18. Is Paul changing the meaning of Jeremiah chapter 18 verse 6 when Jeremiah clearly states that Israel's the clay? Of course he's not. Paul's not changing the Old Testament. He's showing that Israel is the clay. And when you go back and you apply that to uh, Romans chapter 9, verse 6, what Romans 9, 6 is teaching, they are not all Israel that are of Israel. Israel's the clay. And when you apply that to Romans 9, verse 21, that lump of clay that God created in Israel, he made the same lump to, want to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. That lump of clay is separated into vessels of honor, those who believe in Christ, and vessels of dishonor, those who reject Christ. Jesus makes that clear in John 3, 5, when he's speaking to Nicodemus, a Pharisee, who believed that just because he was an Israelite, he had an end to the kingdom of God. When Jesus told Nicodemus, you have to be born of the water, a physical Israelite, and of the Spirit. The only way you can be born of the Spirit is to believe in Him. So Paul is showing the second requirement for an Israelite to be a true Israelite of God. They have to be born of the water and of the Spirit. Okay? So clearly, we, 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 we apply that, and by the way, let's continue. Romans 9.22. Romans 9.22, this is what God says about Israel. What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? God endures with much patience and much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Who are the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? The Israelites who reject their Messiah. God is willing to be patient. Let's show a cross reference to that in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. Now, Peter is the apostle to the Israelites. That's in Galatians chapter 2, verse 8. He's writing specifically to the Israelites. Look at the perfect cross-reference. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward. Who's the usward? The Israelites, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, Calvinists will say, hey, Paul speaking, uh, Peter's writing to the elect. Now let me ask you guys a question. Does that really make sense? God is long suffering, sitting up in heaven, waiting for the elect to waiting for the elect to repent and to confess Jesus Christ. He's being patient. He's being long suffering. Wait a second, God says. I gotta regenerate these guys before they come to repentance. Could you picture God doing that? Can you guys honestly picture God doing that? Oh my goodness, I forgot, I got to regenerate them before they repent. What's God doing being long-suffering or patient to the Israelites, waiting for them to repent, if he's the one that has to regenerate them before they repent? No, God's not being patient or long-suffering. They're fully able to repent. He's being patient, though, and he's being patient to the vessels of wrath fitted to, dis to destruction, those who choose not to repent, but are fully able to repent. I think I just about pretty much covered everything. The hardening of Pharaoh's heart hasn't been mentioned yet, but if it is mentioned, I'll cover that. I'm going to relinquish the rest of my time. 
I think Crossbox and I have three three minute exchanges back and forth. So I'm going to relinquish the rest of my time and give it to Crossbox. Crossbox, you're up. Okay, cool. Uh, well, look. Uh, Lou said that the vessels of wrath who are fitted to destruction are the Israelites who reject God. This completely denies the entire context of Romans 9, and it, it happens to be the subject that we're not supposed to be debating tonight, and that is um, unconditional election. Notice um, what it says here uh, about the twins. It says, though they were not yet born and had done nothing good or bad. What is God's choice based upon? God's purpose. So that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. And Lou's going to say, well, faith isn't a work. Um, that's true, but notice what it also says. They had not been born and had done nothing good or bad. The, the, point, the whole point is still that they hadn't been born. They hadn't believed. They hadn't repented. They hadn't done anything. And surely, um, although faith is not a work, it's still doing something good, right? Um, now... Not only this, but this idea that the vessels of wrath, or the vessels of destruction, rather, are preparing themselves for destruction. Um, the language and the context does not allow for this. Let me post the, the verse in here. Vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. And I should have posted the one right before, because notice what the previous verse says. What's the context? It's the potter having the right over the clay. Um, so obviously God is the one who's preparing them for destruction. And not only that, but this is simple language. Vessels of wrath prepared for destruction. Why would you assume that that means the vessels prepared themselves? That's like saying the ball was thrown. Does that mean the ball threw itself? No, you understand that someone threw the ball. The man was punched. Did the man punch himself? No, you assume he punched, uh, someone else punched him. Um, so vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in no way suggests that they prepared themselves. Um, uh, additionally, we have, uh, it does not say, notice it doesn't say that God endured vessels of wrath with much patience waiting for them to repent and believe. That's not what the verse says. The verse gives the reason. To demonstrate his uh, glory on vessels of mercy. And by the way, this whole idea that the lump of clay, folks, pay close attention, the lump of clay is only Israel, and yet these vessels of mercy are even us, whom he has called not from among Jews only, but from among the Gentiles. That's right after the verse 23, where these vessels are mentioned. Let me post them in the right order. So these vessels are not simply Israelites who are made out of the one lump, which is Israel. That does not follow. Um, th these vessels are from among Jews and Gentiles both. Um, now, let's see here. Let me see if I can... Um, let's see... Um, I was going to ask a question, but, you know, with that said, I think Lou will have some, some things to say along those lines. Maybe we can get this idea of these vessels squared away. Uh, it's most obviously not only about Israel here. Go ahead, Lou. Well, thank you, Chris. Boss. First of all, let me respond to your first argument, Romans 9, 11, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him that call it. Now, by what basis, he asked the question, what's God's choice based upon? God's choice is based upon the f of his foreknowledge. God had foreknowledge. God foreknew that, that Esau would despise his birthright and Jacob would do anything to obtain it. Remember what it says here. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. God foreknew. God knew beforehand. God is omniscient. He knew beforehand that Esau would despise his birthright and Jacob would do anything to obtain it. So that's the answer to your first question. Who's the clay? Who's the clay? Well, first of all, clearly Israel's the clay. I mean, Lamentations 4.2 and Jeremiah 18.6 8, Jeremiah can't make things any clearer. The precious sons of Zion, comparable to fine gold, how are they esteemed as earthen pitchers? The work of the hands of the potter. It's got nothing to do with the Gentiles here. Jeremiah 18.6 is also abundantly clear. Who's the clay? O house of Israel, cannot I do with, this, with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. So clearly, Israel's the clay here. It's got nothing to do with the Gentiles. Now, here's the thing. Here's the kicker. When you go to Romans 9.24, the same thing that applies to Israel applies to the Gentiles. Okay? Now, let me, before I go to Romans 9.24, let me go back to Romans 9.21. And we've got to read Romans 9.21 carefully. 
had not the potter power over the clay of the same lump, that means of the one lump, to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. The one lump, the same lump, is Israel in its entirety. God makes one, one vessel unto honor, and that vessel unto honor are those who believe in Christ, those who are born of the water and of the Spirit. The vessel unto dishonor are those who reject Christ, okay? The one lump, one lump of clay, not two, one lump. The same thing applies to uh, the Gentiles as far as believing in Christ, even us whom he had called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. In other words, if you're going to be saved, if you're not an Israelite, you have to believe in Christ. Israel has to believe in Christ. That's the main requirement. It's not, it's not, it's, the Gentiles aren't incorporated into Israel, but all Romans 9.24 is saying that the, the necessity of salvation applies to the Gentiles as much as it applies to Israel. But Israel is the clay. I haven't been able to find one verse in the Old Testament showing that the Gentiles are clay. If Crossbots could find one, I'd like to hear it. But clearly, Israel is the clay. Lamentations 4.2, Jeremiah 18.6, Crossbots, you're up. Well, again, I addressed this in my rebuttal. The only reason that you find that to be a problem is because of your faulty hermeneutic, which says the Old Testament is interpreting the New Testament, and that's just false. It's the other way around. You said clearly Lamentation says the clay is Israel. Again, folks, that's, that's not the point. That's not how we interpret Scripture. The point is, how does Paul use the clay analogy? I already addressed, who are you, O oh man, individual? And he... he he didn't really answer verse 24, he sort of brushed it off. The point that verse 24 says is that those vessels of mercy, which come from that one lump, which Lou says is only Israel, is said to contain Gentiles. It, that's the connection. He says the one lump is, is, is Israel only, and yet it says those very vessels of mercy, which according to Lou only came from Israel, are also made up from, from of Gentiles, okay? As far as God's choice being based on foreknowledge, I'm going to just quote Romans 8.28. For those whom he foreknew, he predestined. That word foreknew there is a verb that God does. He foreknows people, individuals. Uh, this came right before Romans 9. Uh, just as I know, uh, depart from me, I never knew you. It doesn't mean I didn't know facts about you. Christ is saying I never had a relationship with you. Those whom God foreknew in a relational manner, he predestined. It has nothing to do with this idea of foreseen faith or merit. And Lou mentioned faith and selling the birthright, which co completely contradicts um, the verse that says it is not based on what they had done because they were not yet born. Now, in terms of uh, individuals, I want to go through here and, and just point out some of the language that's being used and get, get some of Lou's thoughts on this. Um, once again, not all who are descended from Israel are of Israel. Dis uh, individuals descend from Israel. Uh, I'm just going to post some verses out here. My, my intention is not to span these, but to, to make a point. For he says to Moses, that's an individual, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy singular. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Um, the scripture says to Pharaoh, he's an individual. God dealt with Pharaoh on an individual basis. Um, for this very purpose I raised you up. Um, so then he has mercy on whomever he wills, singular. And he hardens whomever he wills, singular. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who, not what nation. I'd like to, you folks to just, or Luke can tell me how you fit nations into any of this. Who can resist his will? Who are you, O oh man, singular, to answer back to God? If this were about nations or groups of people, what this verse should say is, who are you, O oh people, who answer back to God? Will those things, plural, formed, say to them, uh, he who formed them, why have you made us like this? Obviously not. The point is, um, these are individual people. Okay, these are individual people. Who are you, O oh man? And so my, my question for Lou is, with all these, why does Paul make strict use of these uh, singular pronouns all throughout Romans 9 when he could have easily used plural pronouns to make it clear he was speaking of groups of people or of Israel and multiples of people? Why all the singular pronouns? Go ahead, Lou. Well, Romans 9.15, basically showing God's sovereignty. He's saying, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. God chose to have compassion on Israel. It's his choice. He's sovereign. He could do what he wants. <coughs> Excuse me. Now we go to Romans 9.18. Therefore, had he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardened. 
Once again, God repeats his sovereignty. He can do what he wants. If anybody has a complaint about his election of Israel, that's their problem. God's sovereign, he can do it. He doesn't have to answer to anyone. Uh, also, uh, Crossbox might want to remember that when you go back to Romans 8.29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Did God foreknow Israel? Yes, he did. How do we know? Go to Romans 11, 1 and 2. I say then, had God cast away his people? That's Israel. God forbid. For I am also an Israelite of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God had not cast away his people, which he foreknew. Same Greek word. God foreknew, Romans 8, 29. God foreknew Israel, Romans 11, 2. Now let me go back to Romans 11:16 to show my friend Crossbox, my my uh, my uh, my uh, rival Crossbox here, what it says about Romans 11:16. For if the first fruit be holy, who's the first fruit? Christ is the first fruit. Christ is the first fruit of them that slept. First Corinthians chapter 15. The first fruit be holy, which is Christ. The lump is also holy. What's the lump that's holy? The lump that's holy, the lump of clay that's holy, are the Israelites who believe in Christ. Go back to Romans 9 for that understanding. The branches, the Gentiles are the branches. The Gentiles are not the lump of clay. How do you know? You go back and go to Romans 11:19. Thou will say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Speaking to the Gentiles. The Gentiles are grafted in as the branches. They are not part of that lump of clay. Go back to Romans 9, 6 again. They are not all Israel, which are of Israel. The Israel of God are all the Israelites who embrace Jesus Christ as their Messiah. Jesus taught that to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, verse 5. You need to be born of the water and of the Spirit. Born of the water means to be a physical descendant of Jacob, out of the mother's birth canal, born of the water and of the Spirit, born again, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, clearly, uh, Israel is the clay. The lump is only Israel. And I once, once again want to challenge my friend Crossbox to show me anywhere in the Old Testament. By the way, the Old Testament interprets the New Testament, and the New Testament interprets the Old Testament. We don't change, we don't change understandings. The old interprets the new, and the new interprets the old. They correspond with one another. They are one. Crossbox, you're up. Well, I fully disagree with that last. I think that obviously the historical Protestant position has been that um, the New Testament uh, enlightens the old. Um, and certainly, as I said, when he places them on that equal level and he can just jump around back and forth, he gets to make the Bible say whatever he's want, as he's done all night. I want to answer this idea of, did God foreknow Israel? Look what it says. He posted that already. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Wait a minute. This is Romans 9. What had Romans 8 said? Those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. All whom God foreknew, individually, are predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's salvation. What is Paul's point here? They are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Did God elect Israel as a nation? Yes. What was Paul's point? God didn't elect every individual within Israel, did he? No, that's Paul's entire point in Romans 9. So likewise, did God foreknow Israel? Of course. Did God foreknow every individual of Israel? No. That's the answer. And that's the only way we can make sense out of Romans 9 through 11 flow through together. And that's the only way, as we read later, Romans 11:26. and in this way all Israel will be saved. Wait a minute, Paul. I thought your whole problem in Romans 9 was that not all Israel is saved. But now you're saying all Israel will be saved. What's going on here? Well, if you followed my opening statement, if you followed Paul's argument, I'm not this is Paul's argument here, folks. All Israel will be saved. All those individuals who make up that true Israel will be saved. All whom God foreknew, all whom God elected on that individual basis will be saved. That is a fact um, that is laid out in Scripture. Now, um, let me see here. Lou said God can have mercy on Israel. God can do what he wants. Well, I find it funny. Why is it that God choosing nations and having mercy on nations, 
And by the way, mercy is language of salvation. Uh, uh, I'd like to know how, um, um, first of all, I'd like to point out some of the, again, the language that is being used here, and maybe ask a question of Lou, I'll post it in the room that I've written before. Uh, Lou, can you explain how the constant use of salvific language throughout Romans 9 pertains to nations? Phrases like children of God, children of promise, mercy, compassion, wrath against sin, destruction, hardening, and glory. How can you deny that salvation of individuals is being discussed here? And my second question, since this is my last uh, three minute, I believe that's correct. If you could just say yes or no, Matt, this is my last three minute. Um, um, the objections in Romans 9, how do they make any sense if what Lou's saying is true? And my, my, my last question for Lou, uh, I didn't mean to pile them up at the end here, but since there is never any objection uh, to God's right to choose nations, we never hear that objection. How do you make any sense out of the objections that Paul raises? I mean, uh, okay, go ahead. Well, first of all, Paul isn't raising any objections. He's basically saying if the Gentiles don't like the fact that God chose Israel, it's too bad. God's sovereign, he could do what he wants. Paul's not raising any objections at all. Now, I, want, I, I really need to address Romans 11, 25, and 26, which says all Israel will be saved. All Israel will be saved, by the way. All Israel will be saved, and I'll explain why. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, uh, uh, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. So it's basically at the end of the church age, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, uh, and, and so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, there shall come at a sign the deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. How do we know all Israel shall be saved? Well, we go to Zechariah chapter 13. Zechariah chapter 13 tells us all Israel will be saved. This is what it says. And it shall come to pass. This is, now Zechariah chapters 12 through 14 speak about the time eschatologically when all nations come against Jerusalem. Okay? There's going to come a time when the nations are going to come against Jerusalem. Many Israelites are going to be killed. And in fact, the Bible tells us that two-thirds of them are going to be killed. And it shall come to pass that in all the land, saith the Lord, two parts therein shall be cut off and die. But the, third, but the third shall be left therein. One third of the Israelites will be left. And I will bring the third part through the fire, and we'll refine them as silver is refined, and we'll try them as gold is tried. They shall call on my name, and I will hear them. I will say, it is my people, and they shall say, the Lord is my God. So right, all Israel will be saved. Eschatologically, in the last days, at Christ's second coming, they're going to call on my name. Jesus said, you shall not see me henceforth till you say... Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The Bible tells us that as two-thirds of Israel is being killed, one-third will cry out in the name of Yeshua, cry out in the name of Jesus, and God's going to say they are my people, and they shall say the Lord is my God. So yes, all Israel will be saved. Every single one of them, the one-third that remain, all that are left are going to be saved. Now, Paul doesn't raise any objections. I think what we need to realize here is the Calvinist ability or their attempt to redefine terms. The clay now is not only Israel, it's the Gentiles. But Paul doesn't teach that the clay is the Gentiles. First of all, we know Lamentations 4.2 is clear. Israel is the clay, not the Gentiles. Jeremiah 18.6 is clear. Israel is the clay, not the Gentiles. One lump. Romans 9.21, I got 30 seconds left. Romans 9.21, this is what it says. God made of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. Clearly, the one lump is separated into two groups. One vessel unto honor, the other unto dishonor. The one unto honor are those Israelites who are born again. Physical Israelites that embrace Jesus as their Messiah, they're born again. The vessels unto dishonor are the Israelites who reject Christ. My time is up. I think we have a five-minute closing argument. Cross boss, you're up. All right, thanks, Lou. It's been great. Um, first of all, uh, the fullness, uh, what was this here? Uh, the, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in in verse 25, uh, in, order, in order to answer my verse um, in 26 that says, all Israel will be saved. Well, what's that saying there? Come into what? Until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in to the true Israel. For all Israel will be saved. And we, like I already said, uh, and, and later on in just a few verses it says, For God has consigned all to disobedience, that he may have mercy on all. Now this isn't, this isn't every individual. 
what this is saying is God consigned not only the Jews but the Gentiles and now he's having mercy on not only the Jews but also the Gentiles that's been the consistent theme throughout all of this it's both Jews and Gentiles now Lou said Paul's not uh, raising any objections um, my point about the objections which I didn't get to get out before my segment ended was that he raises the objection after he's basically te taught unconditional choice of individuals why does God still find fault is there any injustice with God? The only way those objections, my point was, the only way those objections make any sense at all is if it's of individuals. Because if you haven't noticed, folks, when people are arguing against Calvinists, that's exactly when those objections come up. Isn't it ironic how those very objections that Paul raises, well, that wouldn't be fair. Why would God then blame us if he's the one who chose who would be saved, right? That's Paul's point. You know that you are interpreting Romans 9 properly when you come to the same conclusions, or excuse me, when, you're, when, you're, when you raise the same objections in your own mind to this idea. And like I said, those objections have no basis if it's about nations. Nobody ever had a problem with God choosing nations, right? So wh why the objections? That was my point in that. Now, he said the clay, once again, the clay is not Gentiles. I want to go one more time back to Romans 9, verse 24 and show that, first of all, 23, because he tried to make a disconnect here, but it's not a disconnect. The riches of his glory on vessels of mercy, remember, those vessels who were made from that one lump, which Lou says is Israel, contain even us, whom he has called, not from among Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. It is abundantly clear. And that one lump, um, that one lump, what that's doing is demonstrating, uh, for example, the examples he gave. One father Abraham, two children, one is chosen, one's not. It's the consistent theme all the way through Romans 9. You've got one chosen and one not. Moses, Pharaoh, uh, Jacob, Esau, Isaac, Ishmael, all the way down the line. One father Abraham, one, uh, Isaac's chosen, Ishmael's not. One father Isaac, Jacob's chosen, Esau's not. Um, so with all that said... I hope you've noticed the massive difference between how I handled Romans 9 and how Lou did, okay? Who was it who followed Paul's argument straight through from the start to the finish? Who was it who allowed Paul to define how he's using those Old Testament texts? I wasn't the one continuing, uh, continually placing restrictions on Paul and, and saying, basically, well, since these meant those back there, that must be what Paul means. No, I allow Paul to tell me what Paul means. Right, and and not only this, but um, I gave I gave other examples of scripture where Old Testament things are quoted, like when Jesus quotes the commandments, and he gives new meaning to them. Um, so this idea is not foreign to scripture. I find you know, nobody has a problem with Jesus taking the commandment, "Thou shalt not murder," and expounding on it and saying, "Here's a full, more fuller meaning." But for some reason, when when the plain reading, and that really what it is, folks, it's the plain reading of Romans nine that really gets out to people. This idea that God is choosing individuals. Um, it's that plain meeting which causes people to jump through hoops to get it to say what it's not saying. And I think what you've witnessed tonight is Lou doing just that, bending over backwards, going everywhere but Romans 9, to get Romans 9 away from what it's really saying. He, he won't do that with, um, with things that he doesn't have a problem with, but because he has a problem with individual election, um, that comes into play. Um, uh, so basically, let's just review in the last 30 seconds. Paul's problem raised, not all Israel saved. Not every individual. The problem answered, because not, all, not every individual who descends from Israel is of the true Israel. And he explains that answer by giving examples. He gives examples of Israelites, one being chosen and one not. Right? Um, and, and once again, um, let's see here. Uh, this idea that um, I just want people to once again take what Lou said, study it for yourself, and see does what Lou's saying answer Paul's argument in Romans 9, his problem that he's brought up? Does it answer the problem, or does it simply restate the facts that led to the problem in the first place? Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Klaus Boss. For a couple of the points I really need to make in my closing argument, and, and, and that's this. Paul didn't suddenly become a Calvinist. Uh, the Bible certainly doesn't teach Reformed theology, and Paul's not promoting Reformed theology. If Romans 9 was the only chapter in the entire Bible, Crossbox might even have a case. But Crossbox's, uh, though the Calvinist interpretation of Romans 9 conflicts with the entire Bible. Uh, Romans 9.13. 
few points I need to make. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. Did God literally hate Esau, or did he love Esau less? That's the question you need to ask. Now, let's go to Luke chapter 14, verse 26, and help us understand what's the meaning of that Greek word. If any man come to me, and hate not his father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Is Jesus saying that the requirement to be his disciple is to actually hate your mother, hate your father, hate your wife, hate your children, hate your brethren and sisters? Of course not. What Jesus is saying here is that you need to love him more than you love them. You need to love them less than you love him. You need to put him first. Okay? That same Greek word is used there as in Romans, as in Romans 9.13. Don't let the Calvinists or the Reformed apologists sway you where they say God hated Esau. No, God didn't hate Esau. He loved Esau less than he loved Jacob. Why? Because Esau, first of all, that's a quote of the Edomites in Malachi 1, 1 through 4. Did God hate Esau? No, he didn't. He loved Esau less than he loved Jacob. Jacob became the child of the promise. He became the beneficiary of the firstborn because Esau despised his birthright. As a nation, God despised Esau as a nation. He didn't despise them in the sense that we understand it. He hated them in the sense that he loved them less. Why? The answer, by the way, is in Obadiah. Is in the book of Obadiah, chapter 1, God loved Esau less because Esau was all exalted and all happy when their brother in Jacob was being persecuted. That's why God loved Esau less. Okay? Uh, let's go on to uh, Romans cha uh, Exodus chapter 4, verse 22, where God says that he's going to harden Pharaoh's heart, because we really didn't get into that too much. God is going to harden Pharaoh's heart. But remember, God calls Israel his firstborn. Okay? God says he's going to harden Pharaoh's heart. But even after God hardened Pharaoh's heart... Pharaoh was refusing to let the people go. Since when does the English word refuse mean that the person isn't able? The Calvinists will have you believe that even though Pharaoh's heart was hardened, Pharaoh couldn't let the people go. Hey, Pharaoh was refusing. Clearly he was able. Exodus 10.3, even after God hardened Pharaoh's heart, God pleased with Pharaoh. How long will thou refuse to humble thyself before me? Let my people go. Clearly, Pharaoh was able, even after God hardened his heart. Now, the clay. I need to really stress the clay situation here. Lamentations 4.2, clearly Israel is the clay, not the Gentiles. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 6, clearly Israel is the clay, not the Gentiles. My worthy opponent, Krushbas, goes to Romans 9, 23 and 24, to say that the Gentiles are the clay. No, the Gentiles aren't the clay. What Paul is saying in Romans 9, 23 and 24 is, the same rules apply to the Gentiles. You need to be a believer in Jesus Christ, just like the Israelites need to be a believer in Christ. But are the Gentiles the clay? No, Israel is the clay. Go back to Isaiah chapter, I mean Romans chapter 9, verse 6 again. They are not all Israel that are of Israel. You need to be a born again Israelite to be of the Israel of God. Romans 9, 21. Had not the potter power of the clay, of the same lump, to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. Out of that, in all the entire Israelite nation, one lump, one lump, out of that one lump, one vessel unto honor. The vessel unto honor are the Israelites who believe in Jesus Christ. The vessels unto dishonor are the Israelites who don't believe in Christ, who refuse, who reject their Messiah. They're the vessels unto dishonor, and the same rules apply to the Gentiles. You need to be a believer in Jesus Christ. No difference between Jew and Gentile when it comes to salvation, okay? It's all about nations, God's election of Old Testament Israel. God has not forsaken Old Testament Israel, and he will deal with Old Testament Israel at the end of the church age when all Israel shall be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Not only the elect, but the entire world. Cross boss, you're up. Uh, the mic is yours, and we're going to close the room up. This debate is concluded. Yeah, I'd just like to offer my uh, 
um, my uh, 